In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in Him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. In this conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus, we see Jesus ministering to this religious man about the love of God and the kindness and the compassion that Jesus had for him. Just previous to that verse, we see Jesus talking to Nicodemus about how he must be born again and what it means to be born again, what it means to be born of the Spirit of God and how when you're born of the Spirit of God, there will be rivers of living water that will come up from your gut out of your mouth and you'll have life and you'll have hope. Well, today I want to talk about the love of God, my friends. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, when Adam and Eve were walking in the cool of the day with God, we see God wanting to have a relationship with mankind. God said to Adam and Eve, Hey, I want you to name the animals. I want you to walk with me in the cool of the day. I want you to know me. I want you to know my heart. I want to hear from you too. I want to hear what you would name animals. I want you to take care of the garden that he had created. Here's the thing about God. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you remember with me, God came back into the garden and Adam and Eve's natural reaction was to hide themselves from God. Don't we do the very same thing when we sin or when we disobey God or when we fall short in something before God? What do we naturally do? We naturally tend to hide ourselves from God or hide the areas of our lives uh, from God. In 1 John 1 7 it says, For if you walk in the light as he is in the light, then you will have fellowship one with another and the blood of the Lord Jesus will cleanse you of all sin. Well that fellowship that God wants to have with each one of us is an honest fellowship. It's a, it's a transparent fellowship. The word fellowship, relationship and prayer all go hand in hand. You know we live in a day where prayer has become more like mantras, more like robotic prayers. It's kind of like that prayer that you pray before before you eat your food or the pray that you prayer the prayer that you pray before you pray at night god is more interested in relationship than he is in robotic prayers god loves us so very much that christ went to the cross to reconcile us back into that same relationship that was broken when adam and eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that relationship was broken Yet God still did not abandon mankind. We see God when he comes into the garden calling Adam and Eve's name out. Remember what Adam and Eve do? They come out from behind the bush and they're covered over in fig leaves. And God was full of compassion for them. He could see that the fig leaves they had made were uncomfortable and didn't fit right. So what did God do? Well, we see God taking an animal and for the first time we see death enter into the garden. God took an animal and he skinned the animal and he clothed Adam and Eve. Even in Adam and Eve's disobedience, even in them feeling forsaken by God, God was still caring for them. God was still loving on them. God still wanted to put his arms of love and embrace them and call them his, his, his own. Even though there was consequences and ramifications, and we still feel that to this very day, we see God throughout all of history reaching out into mankind and saying, Hey, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to know you. We see that all the way through, even when Adam and Eve had kids with Cain and Abel and how God wanted to have a relationship with even Cain, telling Cain, hey, where's your brother? And then he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not my brother's keeper, but we still see even God in that, wanting to have a relationship with us. Even though Cain had lied to God, God still, even though he knew the truth, still pursued man through relationship. We see God pursuing man even with Noah and how God wanted to have a relationship with Noah. We see God how he wanted to pursue a relationship with Abraham. And we see that with Isaac and with Jacob. We see that even all the way through when Israel gets established in the promised land, how God wanted a relationship with Israel and kept rising up judges and kings and prophets that he could get the attention of his people and walk in relationship with them. When, when Christ was born through the Virgin Mary and lived a sinless life, and, and, and loved on people. We see here now the embodiment of God trying to reach out to mankind again to say, I want to have this relationship with you. I want to walk with you just like I walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus walked with disciples and walked with mankind here on this planet. Isn't that amazing that God was with us, born amongst us, lived amongst us, loved on all of us, and yet walked with us so intimately, so powerfully, what I want you to notice about everybody that came to Jesus, nobody walked away from him worse off. They all walked with him in relationship with him and walked away better. 
God wants to have a relationship with us. God cares about us. God wants to walk one on one with us. And when we walk with him, things do get better. That's why Jesus said to Nicodemus, that's why you must be born again. You see, this wasn't about a religion. This wasn't just about prayers and reading from a book and following rules. And, and it wasn't just another organized religion that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He was talking about a re relationship, uh, an organic move of God within a person where they are born of the Spirit of God. Friends, as an evangelist, it's not our goal to go out there and argue people into salvation or argue people into believing like Christians believe. If we can argue somebody into the faith, then that same person can be argued out of the faith. Friends, we're not here to argue people or persuade people. We want to contend for the faith. We want to define what we believe. We want to know what we believe and we want to have the, the, the logic and the wisdom and the way to articulate our faith in a very clever way. But friends, we don't rely on wisdom to see anybody convert to Jesus Christ. You see, conversion is different than persuasion. We can try to persuade, and like King Agrippa, when the Apostle Paul was trying to witness with King Agrippa, King Agrippa said to Paul, I was almost persuaded by your great wisdom, your great apologetics, but he was just almost persuaded. In our natural skills, in our own wisdom, that's the best that we can do as evangelists is almost persuade people. But conversion is a mystery. And I want to talk about conversion just a little bit because it is a mystery. We can have the most amazing gifts to communicate, the most amazing gifts to preach, the most amazing skill sets to, to defend the faith, yet we fall short in trying to convert anyone to Jesus Christ. How does conversion take place? Well, what is conversion? Well, conversion is a, is a lifestyle change. It, it's, a, it's a change in direction. It, it's literally, I was going this way in this religion, and then met Jesus, and now I'm going Jesus' way in, in His direction. It's more than just goosebumps. It's more than just a natural reaction of, of emotionalism where we raise up a hand. No, this is conversion. This is where God comes and lives on the inside of us and redirects us. We get a new direction when we come to Christ. God redirects our mindset. He, re he redirects our future. He redirects our perspective. He even redirects our destiny. That's the most amazing thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know what? Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in Him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. It is a promise for anyone that believes on Jesus to have assurance of eternal life, to have assurance of everlasting life. It is our assurance. We can be assured, we can be confident, we can be bold, we can have authority when it comes to our salvation in Jesus Christ. We can say to all of our doubts and to all the lies of the enemy and the accuser of the brethren that we have assurance of everlasting life. Why? Not because we deserve it, not because we are good enough for it. We know back in the Garden of Eden that just like Adam and Eve fell short of God's simple rule to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that we all have eaten of that same tree, if we were to be honest with ourselves. Think about it when we were kids, when our parents would tell us, hey, do this, and we do the opposite. Hey, eat this type of food, it's the healthiest, but we want dessert and we want fast food. We are bent on unhealth. We are bent on sin. We are prone to wander. We're prone to fail. It is our natural nature to do so. That's why, my friends, we need to be born again. That's why when we come to Christ, all things pass away and behold, all things become new. The, the old nature that's within us gets suppressed by this new nature of heaven that comes and lives on the inside of us. While we're in these physical bodies, we won't be perfect. While we're in these physical bodies, we will fall short, we will fail, we will stumble. Remember with 